Hello there, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Fighting Game Retrospective, the show where we dive deep into the backstory behind the creation and impact of some of our favorite fighting game franchises. And so far, we've covered cult fan favorites, we've covered legendary titles that launched entire universes, pretty important series for the history of fighting games. But there's something that we haven't touched upon yet, something that no genre can go without. Bad games. Yeah, I know this might be a crazy thing to say, but sometimes the flops can be just as interesting to talk about as the successes. And when it comes to fighting game flops, you have to talk about Capcom Fighting Evolution. And I won't lie to you, I have literally wanted to talk about this game since the inception of fighting game retrospectives. Ever since I thought this show up, this game was way, way up there on the to-do list because I wanted to cover the insane story behind it. I have spent months researching the backstory of how this unique mess came to be, but I still wasn't planning on covering it just yet. No, I mean, this is our third episode. You can't start talking about bad games on the third episode. You save that for the double digits. So I had zero plans of covering this game so early into this series, but then one day, Matt McMuscles, a YouTuber with a wonderful series called What Happened that covers the backstory of troubled game development, out of nowhere posted a screen cap of Capcom Fighting Evolution on Twitter, and I realized, oh crap, if I'm going to talk about this, I have maybe a week to get this video made. So, yeah, let's go ahead and roll that intro, because time is my enemy here. Enjoy! Okay, let's go ahead and address the big question right off the bat. Hey Aaron, you might be asking, why the heck would you want to talk about this game? Isn't Fighting Game Retrospective a show where you cover a series of games? Capcom Fighting Evolution is just one single game. Yeah, here's the thing. Capcom Fighting Evolution, or Capcom Fighting Jam as it was known to the rest of the world, may only be one game, but it's one game that was born from the cancellation of a completely different game, and that completely different game was also born from the cancellation of a completely different game, and the impact that Capcom Fine Evolution made, or more accurately, failed to make, actually went on to impact Capcom's fighting games for years, almost killing the entire industry off, and has left a stain on Capcom's business decisions that has remained to this day. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Before we talk about the game itself, we have to go back to its origins. And the story of Capcom Fighting Evolution actually began here. Feel the intensity when power and technique collide. Crush the competition. A battle beyond your imagination. Let the martial arts madness begin. 2001 is the year we make contact. Welcome to the revolution. Capcom versus SNK2. Yes, the Capcom versus SNK games were a big hit, not just financially, but critically as well. To this day, they're hailed as some of the best fighting games of all time. And it's a shame that the games ended on the second installment. It would have been great if we could have gotten a Capcom versus SNK3. Fun story, back in 2002, Capcom wanted to make a Capcom versus SNK3. But there was just one problem with that. SNK at the time was kind of busy... going out of business? Yeah, Capcom vs. SNK 2 was released in August of 2001. And in October of 2001, SNK went bankrupt. Talk about life coming at you fast. One month you're sharing the stage with Capcom to put out the biggest fighting game of the year. Two months later, you're selling your franchises out of the trunk of your car. And that's not as much of an exaggeration as you might think. They couldn't even finish the newest King of Fighters game that year and needed Korean company Eolith to step in and take over the franchise till they could get back on their feet. 
So, in 2002, when Capcom came back asking SNK if they wanted to team up again, I can only imagine that conversation wasn't very long and probably involved a lot of crying. However, with SNK going bankrupt, that meant that a lot of former developers were out of work. Developers that Capcom had worked closely with on Capcom vs. SNK. So they thought, hey, you guys have experience taking all of your characters and putting them together into one single fine game? Why don't we do that? And so Capcom recruited 20 former SNK employees to build their own crossover fighting game, with former King of Fires director Toyohisa Tanabe overseeing the project. This would go on to be Capcom Fighting All-Stars. At least it would have gone on to be Capcom Fighting All-Stars if it actually got made. Yes, this is where the story of Capcom Fighting Evolution really begins, with a completely different game, which is ironic since this completely different game itself came from a completely different game. Yeah, you remember how I said that Capcom originally wanted to make Capcom vs SNK 3 instead of this game? Well, here's the thing. Capcom just couldn't contain their excitement and already got to work on some early character animations and movesets for Capcom vs SNK 3, so when Capcom vs SNK 3 didn't happen, they decided, eh, screw it, let's just import them into this new game. Now, don't get me wrong, there is nothing wrong with reusing assets. It's actually a pretty smart move, cost-effective, and many great games have been built upon reused assets, especially fighting games. It's just hilarious to me that Capcom Fighting Evolution came from the ashes of the cancelled Capcom Fighting All-Stars, which in itself came from the ashes of Capcom vs SNK 3. This game had to be developed in a pet cemetery because every single time that it died, it came back to life more screwed up than before. Well, sometimes, that is better. And as you can tell from the footage that you're seeing, they decided to make this game 3D, which means that that is what they had planned for Capcom vs SNK 3. A few years before this, Street Fighter had moved into the third dimension with Street Fighter EX, and shortly after this, SNK would make their own 3D fighters with King of Fighters Maximum Impact, so it's clear that this was the direction that both companies were moving in. Now, when Tanami was put in charge of this project, he made himself right at home and brought his SNK history with him. In an interview with Capcom in 2017, Tanami said that he wanted to, quote, make something with our own flavor and make something that wasn't very Capcom-like. Ah, yes! Because when you're putting together the first ever Capcom in-company crossover game, you of course want to make it, quote, not very Capcom-like. But he expanded upon this and said that he wanted the characters to be stylish and for there to be a deep story, something that the King of Fighter games were known for. They were going to give every character their basic design and outfits, but then each character would also have a stylish alternate costume. And Capcom was giving Tanabe a lot of freedom on this project, but apparently this costume idea is where they drew the line. According to him, he had finalized the design for Ryu's, quote, stylish costume, and while we've never seen this design, apparently this was the thing that caused Capcom to step in and say, yeah, no, not happening. Apparently, if you give Ryu a nice shirt and decent shoes, it just causes Capcom executives to start screaming in terror like they saw a ghost. Their brains can't handle it. Now, as for the big, deep story that he won, the game would focus on Metro City, as a mysterious villain named Death had planted bombs around the city. Mayor Hagar called upon a group of new heroes called the Code Holders to come together to help save the city, and along the way they would be joined by several other characters from the Capcom universe who found themselves in Metro City at this time. Now these bombs actually played into the overall story in kind of a big way, as there would be multiple endings to the game that would depend on how fast you beat it. Essentially, the bombs were on a timer, meaning the quicker you beat the game, the better the ending you got. The game introduced three brand new characters to be the central heroes of the story, Ingrid, Dee Dee, and Rook, although in later interviews they clarified his name was actually Luke. This was another very King of Fighters style approach, bringing in all your heroes from different franchises, but the protagonists of the game where they all come together would be brand new characters. These three heroes, as well as the villain Death, were known as Code Holders, as they had special cells in their body that gave them powers. Ingrid was a natural code holder, being born with the power of a long lifespan. In fact, Tanabe said that he imagined her as being around 80 years old, and her father, Death, was born with the power of a shortened lifespan, but in return, he could turn his body into living dark matter. Now, you might be asking right now, wait, Ingrid has the power of a long lifespan and is 80 years old, but her father, who is still alive, is cursed with a shortened lifespan. How does that work? What? I just addressed the fact that we're all thinking that question. I didn't say that I had an answer to it. 
But the other two code holders were Didi, who Tanabe said would be the game's protagonist and had super strength that caused his fist to glow crimson, as well as his partner Luke, who had super speed and Tanabe said was supposed to be so cool that his name was literally just cool in Japanese spelled backwards. Now, Didi and Luke became code holders when a mysterious organization experimented on them and implanted these code holder cells inside of them. Now, remember when I said that Tanabe brought his SNK history with him to this game? Yeah, if you're a King of Fighters fan, does this guy remind you of anything? <laughs> Folks, if your fighting game protagonist is a leather-clad bad boy with sunglasses who has a burning red fist, got powers from a secret organization implanting superpower cells inside of them, and their name is just a letter, that's not Didi, that's K-Dash. The second protagonist of the King of Fighters franchise, whose storyline ended the very year this game was being made. I'd make the mind if I copy your homework joke here, but Tanabe came from King of Fighters. He's copying his own homework on this one! Now as for the rest of the cast, there was of course the previously mentioned Hagar, as well as Poison, who would be making her first playable appearance outside of a Final Fight game. Then, from Street Fighter, there would be Ryu, Chun-Li, Alex, and Nash. From Rival Schools, there would be Batsu and Akira. And most surprisingly, Strider Hiryu. But that wasn't all. There would also be three secret characters. Akuma and Dimitri would appear as unlockables, and the final character would be a guest character. Yes, Tanabe got in touch with SNK and cleared all the legal hoops he had to jump through, and they were going to include an SNK character in the roster. And while they refused to this day to say who that character was going to be, probably for legal reasons, Capcom did release this silhouette of the character and, uh, gee, I wonder who it could be. Yeah, so not only were we about to get Tanabe's original K-Dash OC Do Not Steal, we were also going to get original recipe K-Dash as well. As for the gameplay, Capcom Fine All-Stars featured a lot of brand new mechanics, including a finishing blow move, a super you could perform on an opponent after you beat them, like a Mortal Kombat Fatality, a counter system where you could slide around your opponent and counterattack them at the same time, a round break that would happen when an opponent had lost two-thirds of their life, where all combat would stop for a moment, assumably to prevent someone from just doing a one-touch full-life combo, and perhaps the craziest thing I have ever heard of in a fighting game in my entire life, the Declaration of Victory. This would essentially be a taunt that you could perform before the match if you were fighting another live player. If you did this and you won, then you would get a special win pose. But if you lost one round, you lost the entire match. I am not joking. If you enter Declaration of Victory, you essentially said to your opponent, if I win, I get to style on you, and in return, you only have to beat me once instead of twice. You are essentially cutting your life in half just for bragging rights. Can you imagine if this game had actually gotten made and it ended up taking off, and you tune in to the grand championships of fighting all-stars at EVO one year, and you see the two best players on the planet come walking down, sit up at their stand, and then one of them inputs, the Declaration of Victory. The crowd would lose its mind like we had never seen before. The game also featured some of the craziest input commands for any character I have ever seen, like this. This is an actual move from the game. Can you tell this was made by an SNK dev? Even Capcom's own website, when they wrote about this game in 2017 said, and I quote, what the hell is up with that command? Now, Capcom would show this game off at the Tokyo Game Show in 2003, while also doing location tests in arcades around Japan at the same time. But sadly, later that year the game was cancelled, and while Tanabe says there were several reasons for this, he doesn't really go into any details why. However, there is one thing that we do know for sure. Capcom Fighting All-Stars was really, really bad. Yes, we don't exactly know what was wrong with the game, and shockingly enough, still to this day there haven't been any emulations of it, so we really only have this handheld camera footage from the location test to go on, but apparently the people who played the game in arcades and even Capcom's own internal teams all agreed, this thing wasn't good. Well, that's what location tests are for, right? Do a test run, interview the players, take the critiques into consideration, and start making some changes, right? 
Well, initially, that was the plan. Tanabe increased the size of his work team to address these complaints, only for the game to then get cancelled anyways, leading to Tanabe leaving Capcom. And that was it. That was the end of Capcom Fighting All-Stars. But it was just the beginning for Capcom Fighting Evolution. Yeah, Capcom still wanted to make their own crossover fighting game, so they decided to start anew with Yoshinori Ono in the driver's seat. Now, okay. You might hear that and think, oh, Yoshinori Ono, the guy who helped to revive the fighting game industry with Street Fighter 4, and for years after that was the face of Capcom's fighting game division? That is a perfect fit for this job! Well, here's the thing. This wasn't the Ono that we know today. This was Ono still early in his career where he had almost exclusively worked on the music and sound design for Capcom's games. In fact, at this point, he had only been the lead producer on one game, Chaos Legion, a game most of you didn't know about before this video and will probably forget about as soon as I finish this sentence. What were we talking about? Oh, right, yes. So, my point is, I know we might think, oh, the guy who was the big face of Capcom's fighting games, working on the Capcom fighting game crossover, that's a slam dunk. But at this point in Ono's career, it was more like a businessman at Capcom went up to Ono's desk while he was trying to eat his lunch and said, hey, you. Guy who was the sound producer on Spawn in the Demon's Hand. You know anything about Street Fighter? Um... Yeah? Great, you're making our new fine game, don't screw it up. Even Ono himself would go on to say the project was just dropped in his lap out of nowhere after Fighting All-Stars was cancelled and Tanabe left the company. And I'll admit, I'm kind of hot and cold on Ono's time on Capcom's fighting games. On the one hand, he revived the genre with the excellent Street Fighter 4, and he fought hard to bring Darkstalkers back, which I appreciate. But on the other hand, he was responsible for Street Fighter Cross Tekken, the shoddy state of Street Fighter V's launch. And if leaked info coming out of Capcom is to be believed, the current shoddy state of Street Fighter VI. But let me be clear. Ono ain't to blame for fighting evolution because nobody could have salvaged this. Because Capcom didn't just pick a young developer with no experience leading a project like this, they also gave him a massively reduced budget and only one year to complete the game. Now, you might think, okay, that sounds bad. But not too bad, I mean, he already had a nearly complete game sitting right there in Fighting All-Stars. Even if the budget is small, he had a whole year to address the problems that the testers had with this game, right? Yeah, that would have been the smart thing to do. Funny thing about that though, Ono couldn't use anything from Fighting All-Stars because he had to start completely from scratch. Why is that? Why, if you have a nearly complete game that you had poured time and money into, would you not just fix the problems in that game rather than starting on a brand new game? That's like saying, hey, there's a hole in our roof. Should we patch it up? Nah, let's just build a brand new house from the ground up. Honestly, there is no way for us to know exactly what went down behind the scenes here. Capcom is a very secretive company after all. But based on what little we do know, if I had to take a guess, I'd say there might have been some bad blood between Tanabe and Capcom. I already mentioned that they disagreed on things like stylish Ryu, but Tanabe admits they argued on plenty during the game's production, all the way down to the name of the game itself. This kind of feels like it might have been personal, and yes, fixing the problems and fighting all-stars would have been the smart thing to do, but nothing hard counters smart business decisions like Spite. That is a matchup that you will always lose. I have seen video game companies throw out gold mines that they spent years working on just because someone on the staff looked at the boss the wrong way. And as I said earlier, we live in a day and age where you can emulate almost any arcade game ever made even if it never got a home release and yet nobody can get their hands on the data for fighting all-stars. Which makes me think that Capcom might have burned all traces of it from the face of the Earth. And that's not something you do just because it doesn't run smoothly. You do that because you're working out some personal issues. So, okay. Ono now only had one year to make a fully functioning fighting game, something he had never done before, and he had almost no money to do it. So, he had to figure out the cheapest option to make this happen. Luckily, making cheap fighting games quickly was something Capcom was kinda known for at the time. 
Yes, as I said, this whole thing began with Capcom wanting to make a new CVS game, and those games ended up recycling mini sprites from one game or another, or even from other Capcom fighting games. And of course, there's the Marvel games, where most of the Street Fighter sprites just come straight from the Alpha series, and the Marvel characters were just imported from one game to another. So Fighting Evolution's roster would be divided into five categories, each representing a different franchise, and the sprites would just be ripped straight from those games. These five categories were Street Fighter 2, featuring Gao, Ryu, M. Bison, and Zangief, Street Fighter Alpha, featuring Guy, Rose, Karin, and Sakura, Street Fighter 3, featuring Chun-Li, Alex, Yuri, and Yoon, Darkstalkers, featuring Dimitri, Anna Karis, Felicia, and Jetta, and shockingly enough, Red Earth, featuring Leo, Kindry, Hydron, and Hauser. Now, okay, Street Fighter and Darkstalker, of course they were going to make it in. They were the two big faces of Capcom first-party fighting games at the time. But Red Earth? Why Red Earth? Well, simply put, because that game used the same engine as Street Fighter 3, so it was pretty easy to just rip the sprites straight from that game and put them in here. Now there were a few other additions. Shinokuma and Pyron acted as boss characters, and right there in the middle of this very, very awkward looking character select screen was the final character, Ingrid. Yes, Ono wanted to pay respect to fighting all-stars since it's the game that started all of this, so he included one of the new code holder characters. However, he changed Ingrid significantly from her original intention. Instead of being what was essentially the Capcom Universe version of mutants with their own X-Gene, she was now known as the Eternal Goddess and was a powerful being that watched over the universe. Now, we're gonna delve further into Ingrid later, don't you worry, but for now, let's look at this roster and right off the bat, you can see one of the first problems with this game. This roster... kinda sucks. I mean, okay, in all fairness, they obviously couldn't use any characters from any games that didn't already have sprites that lined up exactly with this game's art style, so no Devil May Cry, no Resident Evil. Heck, they couldn't even use anything from their 3D fighting games like Rival Schools or Power Stone. But even with that stipulation being taken into consideration, you got Chun-Li in Street Fighter 3? A character who didn't appear in Street Fighter 3 until its final installment? This just screams we had too many characters from Street Fighter 2, so we just shoved them in wherever we could. And speaking of Street Fighter 2, this collection is... fine. But we're missing characters like Ken and Kami, big fan favorites from the game. And don't get me wrong, I understand sometimes you have to make tough cuts for a limited roster space. Boy, do I ever understand that. But I think most fans would have preferred to include them over who we got. Then there's the Darkstalkers block. Now, okay. I will admit I kinda hate that Morgan is always the representative Capcom uses for Darkstalkers. I would like to see some of the other characters get some screen time, but the whole point of this game is it's the biggest names of these games crossing over. So you left out the character who was the face of the franchise? I mean, it's not even like you only had one Darkstalker spot, so you had to come in here and say, all right, do we use the face of the franchise or do we get creative with it? You had four spaces. There was easily space for her in here. Why Dimitri? Why Anna Karis? Was it so you could squeeze in their transformation abilities? Was it that important that we got to see the Midnight Bliss version of all these characters? That's... an interesting use of your very limited resources. And Red Earth... Oh, Red Earth... Now, for anyone who doesn't know, Red Earth is a game where you only have four selectable characters and you basically just go down a boss rush of big monsters. So Red Earth is a game where you only have four playable characters. This game includes four spots for each franchise. So of course, we're only going to include two of the playable characters and the other two slots are going to big boss monsters. And was one of the two playable characters that we include Tessa, the most popular Red Earth character that actually crossed over into multiple other games? No, of course not. Why would it be? Enjoy the squid monster. So, yeah, this roster might have had massive restrictions placed on it, but even with those restrictions, it still kind of stinks. Now, it's worth pointing out that there was originally going to be a Street Fighter 1 spot that would include Sagat with his sprite redesign to take away his scar, Eagle using his sprite from Capcom vs SNK2, and Retsu, which would be his very first playable appearance using brand new sprites made just for this game. It'll cost you. Yeah. Yeah. It's right. it's not, it's which might be why they didn't make it in. All that sounds like it requires work. 
And then there's the size of the roster. Now, don't get me wrong, 23 characters is decent, especially back in the early 2000s. That was a pretty impressive number back then. Unless you're making a crossover game that uses pre-existing sprites. Then, yeah, that's not great. It's actually pretty small. I mean, games like Marvel and Capcom vs. SNK had rosters in the 40s and 50s at the time using the exact same technique, and they even managed to introduce some new characters in every single game, meaning they had to take the time to make new sprites in every single one of those installments. But most importantly, they also spiced up the gameplay, meaning they had to change every single character from the games that their sprites originally came to, so that way they could all fit together cohesively into this brand new gameplay style. And that did require a lot of work. I mean, can you imagine if Ryu was in Marvel vs. Capcom and he played just like he did in Street Fighter 2? That would be crazy! Guess what this game did? Yes, they tried to make each character play like they did in their respective games. And I don't mean Ryu still does down forward punch to do a Hadouken, no, no, no. I mean Street Fighter 2 characters played like Street Fighter 2. Street Fighter 3 characters played like Street Fighter 3. Darkstalkers characters played like Darkstalkers. Which is Fighting Evolution's next big problem. As I said, the game featured five different franchises, and each of these individual franchises had their own unique playstyles. Street Fighter Alpha characters could perform their regular supers, or they could also perform their custom combos from Alpha 2. They could also perform air blocks, recovery rolls, and alpha counters, which were maneuvers from the Alpha series that allowed you to counter attacks while blocking. Street Fighter 3 characters had EX specials, powered up versions of their regular specials, two bars for their super meter, and parries. Red Earth characters could spin their meter to level themselves up to give them stronger moves, as well as having an ultimate guard that blocked all attacks and could lead into a counter. Darkstalkers characters could also perform EX specials, guard cancels, air blocks, OTG attacks, had three bars of supers, and chain combos which allowed you to link your basic attacks together. Ingrid had her own playstyle that included a level 1, 2, and 3 super, high jumps, air blocks, guard cancels, and a rolling move that could avoid attacks, almost like a callback to her clear King of Fighters inspiration. And lastly, Street Fighter 2 characters, when you knock them down, could delay their stand-up animation to try and mess with your opponent's timing. And that was it! Yeah, no air blocking, no EX moves, only one bar for supers, this game was massively unbalanced. And while I've heard different people over the years argue which team had the best, we all know who had it the worst. But this was one of the reasons why people gave games like Marvel or CVS a pass when they saw recycled sprites. The characters felt new in those games, or at least similar enough to how they played but balanced together so their styles could all work together. Here, it really did feel like they were just copied and pasted. It felt lazier than those other games that recycled sprites, and again, those games tended to have way larger rosters. So this game put in less work for less characters. Well, okay. I shouldn't say there was no work done. They did attempt to balance these characters out a little, but all of these balances were made for the worse. For example, many characters had moves taken away, especially the Street Fighter 3 characters. I mean, they include Yurian, but he now couldn't pull off the combos with his Aegis Reflector that made Yurian good. There it is. <laughs> what? I'm out. What's the problem? <laughs> Leave it alone. It doesn't launch? I'm out. Shut up. And that's something I should bring up right now. I've been talking about this game like it's absolute trash, but it's not. I've actually talked to people who remember playing this game a long time ago before they got into fighting games, or they never got into fighting games, but they did try this out and they thought it felt fine, and honestly, yeah, I mean, it's functional. It is a fighting game, you do press buttons and things happen. If you don't really know these characters, you might not realize why people have problems with it, but if you do know these characters, this is like getting behind the wheel of a car that you used to drive all the time, but now someone has messed with the transmission and let some of the air out of the tires. And to make matters worse, they decided to slap right on the back of the box that the characters would play just as you remember them, which is a technique that we like to call lying. They were lying about that. And these problems weren't just restricted to the gameplay itself, it was also all over the presentation. You see, some of these games were known for their smooth animation, loaded with in-between frames, 
while other older games didn't have animation quite so good. So, what were we going to do? Draw brand new sprites to improve the older fighters? Oh, oh, I'm not yeah, the taxes! The finger thing means the taxes! Of course not, that would cost money and time that we do not have. So instead, they took frames out of the newer characters' animations so they would look worse to match the animation of the older characters. Yeah, now featuring worse animation is not exactly the selling point that you were hoping it would be. And that presentation didn't stop at the animation, no, just take a look at those backgrounds. Characters had different textures to them, characters in the foreground were fuzzy while characters in the background would be crisp. And while I want to applaud this game for how many cameos they put in the background, yeah, most of these are just blurry artwork taken from other sources. I mean, look at that Hugo in the background. That's just lifted right from his sprite in Street Fighter 3. It's a copy and paste in the most literal sense. Now, there was one thing about the presentation I will applaud though, and actually is kind of important to the history of Capcom. Every character's ending was presented as a page of a comic book and some of these pages aren't all that interesting, but some of them are actually pretty cool. Alex wrestles Hagar, Ryu fights John Talbane, Jetta ends up going up against Dante, Felicia puts on a big Vegas show with several other Capcom characters. These were actually pretty fun. But most importantly, these comic pages were done by the comic company Udon. And in September of 2003, when this game was being worked on, they started making the official Street Fighter comics that they are still making to this day. So it looks like them making these comic page endings was sort of a big synergy moment for Udon in these Street Fighter comics, and well, considering that they've made these books for over 15 years now, it looks like this game did help to cement a strong partnership between the two companies. But speaking of the legacy of these games, let's talk about Ingrid. She would actually go on to appear in several other Capcom games, and almost appeared in even more games. Yeah, I'm not kidding, she was actually going to be in Tatsunoku vs Capcom and Ultimate Marvel vs Capcom 3 before being cut at the last minute, and Ono even said that she was a possible DLC character for Street Fighter V. But as for her actual appearances, she was brought over to the handheld version of Street Fighter Alpha 3, and she was in Project Cross Zone 2 in her own special mission called The Code Holders, a nice little reference back to her origins. And she even appeared in the limited edition Street Fighter Cross Tekken prequel comic, where it is revealed that the magical MacGuffin that everyone is chasing in that game, Pandora, was her own creation. Now, with all these appearances and being considered for so many big crossover games, clearly Ingrid hit a chord with people and was a beloved character and one of the few good things to come from Capcom Fighting Evolution, right? Ingrid is actually one of the most hated Capcom fighting game characters ever. People despise Ingrid with a burning passion, and I want to make it clear, I am not speaking personally on this one. Honestly, I don't care one way or another about Ingrid. In fact, I actually kind of like the idea of there being some kind of a goddess of the Capcom universe. Some mysterious powerful figure who just pops up from time to time, like an easter egg here or there. I'm a big comic book fan, and Marvel and DC are both loaded with these immortal godly figures who just watch over the universe without really interfering, and are just there to make the audience go, Oh cool, they're here now! I mean, Capcom already has the Yashichi, a recurring hidden symbol in some of their games. Having a Capcom goddess who just randomly appears every now and again in the background of certain scenes would basically just be the same premise but with an actual character. I, for one, think that would actually be cool. But if Capcom is going to do something like that, it ain't happening with Ingrid because I'm afraid that ship has sailed. As I said, people hate Ingrid, and I think it simply comes down to the fact that her first appearance was in a game that people didn't really like, and then her second appearance was in a Street Fighter game where she beats the snot out of everyone, says they were all too easy, cures Ryu of the Satsui no Hato, and then basically calls Bison a punk who couldn't handle a fraction of her power. I mean, don't get me wrong, if Ingrid is a goddess, it would make sense that she was all-powerful. But when your character first appeared in a game that people didn't really like, the way to fix her isn't to say, what if she popped up in a popular franchise and was instantly better than everyone? That's like if Steve Burnside returned to Resident Evil and they decided to make him cool by having him beat the crap out of Chris, Jill, and Leon all at the same time. Again, I do not have problems with Ingrid. I would totally be fine with them trying to bring her back and do something better with her. But I have to be real on this one, and I know what the comment section and chat box has looked like every single time I've mentioned her. 
However, and far more seriously, there were two much larger legacies of Capcom Fine Evolution besides an obscure character people rage over so much it's practically a meme. The first of which was that when this game was being worked on, the arcade scene was starting to die. And since that's where a lot of fine games make the majority of their money, Capcom was starting to shut down that part of their company. Their fighting games were hanging by a thread at this time, and after spending a year on a 3D fighter that went nowhere, and then spending another year on this game, they basically put all of their eggs into this basket. This was the game that was going to decide the future of Capcom's fighting games. And how did the world react to fighting evolution? How do you think they reacted? I mean, I suck at fighting games. My fingers move around the controller like tumbleweeds bouncing around the wind. And even I could tell that these were inferior versions of these characters with shoddy animation. What do you think happened when people who knew these characters' frame data got their hands on it? Most news sources reported that this game was... Okay. It was functional. It worked. But that was about the biggest compliment people could give it, and honestly, considering this game's budget and turnaround time, that is a hell of a compliment. But yeah, critics didn't care for it, fans pretty much hated it, and it failed to sell any impressive numbers. While sales figures in Japan aren't known across the rest of the globe, it only sold 200,000 copies. Maybe enough to make up for this game's production cost, considering it was so low, but not enough to make up for it and fighting All-Stars combined cost. So, yeah, that was pretty much it for Capcom's fighting games. No more Darkstalkers, no more Rival Skulls, no Star Gladiator, no Power Stone, no more Versus games. Even Street Fighter was kind of thrown behind the vault for a little bit. It wasn't until four years later that Yoshinori Ono revived Capcom fighters and the 2D fighting scene in general with Street Fighter 4. And I know that some of you might hear that and think, four years, that's nothing at all. Yeah, today that's nothing at all. You have to remember, back then, Capcom was releasing multiple fighting games every single year, so to suddenly not put out anything in four years? That is kind of a big deal. And it's actually kind of poetic that the game that Capcom shoved into Yoshinori Ono's lap was the one that killed their fighting games, but the game that he was actually passionate about and he fought and struggled to get made is the one that brought them back. And even more poetic that a few years later, he'd make Street Fighter Cross Tekken, which would kill their fighting games all over again. Maybe it wasn't a good idea to leave an entire genre of games for a company up to one man. So despite the damage that Fighting Evolution did, it didn't permanently kill off the genre. And again, their fighting games were already suffering at the time, so you can't place all the blame for their decline on this one game. It was just the straw that broke the camel's back. However, there is one other long-term negative effect for Capcom, that can pretty clearly draw a line straight back to this game. Capcom has some of the most beloved franchises in the history of video games. I'd be willing to say they're second only to Nintendo in terms of memorable characters and worlds. And fans of the Versus games have been saying for years, you know what, Marvel keeps giving you all these legal problems when you try and cross over with them. Why not just do a Capcom versus Capcom game? Why not just make a fighting game featuring characters from your own series crossing over? This. This is why. Yeah, here's the thing about Capcom. They are stuck in their ways so firmly, it borders on being superstitious. They are famous for saying that if a game comes out and underperforms, they will gladly let that game, those characters, that entire franchise die. Put out four great games, then one bad one that nobody buys, they will shove your ass in the vault to rot. These are the guys who haven't made a new Darkstalkers in over 20 years, because we didn't buy enough copies of the fourth, I repeat, fourth re-release of the same games we already owned. Mega Man was one of their biggest franchises of all time, spawning multiple series and smash hit cartoons. So of course, when people didn't buy as many copies of Mega Man 10 as they did of Mega Man 9, they decided not to make any more games for eight years. And even then, they only returned to Mega Man because a Mega Man ripoff game was making bank on Kickstarter headed up by one of their former employees, and Capcom said, oh no you don't, that money is ours! So when you look at Capcom's insane logic of deciding what lives and what dies, it is no surprise that the reason we haven't gotten a Capcom vs. Capcom game, a game that fighting game fans have been clamoring for for years, is because 17 years ago, during the decline of the arcade fighting game scene, a super cheap Mugen didn't sell well. That is the level of crazy that has guided Capcom for generations now, 
and it's unfortunately going to be the longest legacy of this otherwise very forgettable game. So there you have it, the insane, over-the-top story of the game that damaged Capcom fighters in a way that they still haven't recovered from almost two decades later. These days, if you want to see a crossover between Capcom franchises, there are plenty of cool Mugens being made around the idea. I, for one, have been following Capcom Universe fan game on Twitter, and it's actually looking pretty good. Quick shout out to those guys, go and give them a follow. But if you want something official... Well, there's Teppin! Hope you like Teppin! Actually, Teppin is pretty dope, I can't be mad at that game. I don't know why I made it sound like it was disappointing, I actually really dig Teppin. But in terms of actual console games or fighting games, yeah, that still doesn't look too likely anytime soon. But if it ever does happen, you can bet that we will cover it here. Thanks again for tuning in to another episode of Fighting Game Retrospectives, everyone. If you know of a fighting franchise that you would love to hear me cover, let me know in the comments down below or find me on Twitter at twitter.com slash Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Stay safe out there and come back next time.